The talk tonight is in a way overdue. Uh, we've been doing these seminars about long-term thinking for almost three years now and haven't had a single one about religion. Uh, we've had a couple where religion was referred to, usually approvingly, because it is clearly a long-term frame of reference. Uh, most religions have rights having to do with, with birth, with marriage, and with death, and they, they step right up to generational issues when lots of other institutions do not. But this is not what you would call a sanctimonious version <laughs> of religion we'll be looking at tonight. Um, it's a critique in light of current events. Uh, it's a critique in light of, I suppose, current science, current rationality. And um, Sam Harris's book joins a couple of others that I would recommend to you. Uh, One True God by Rodney Stark. The subtitle there is uh, The Historical Consequences of Monotheism. Uh, the philosopher Daniel Dennett has a book coming out very shortly called Breaking the Spell. And uh, we're beginning to see a, a pretty deep literature addressing some of the profound issues of religion uh, through history and in our time. And that's what we have tonight with Sam Harris. Sam. Well, it's really, it's a pleasure to be here, and I, I want to thank Stuart and the rest of the Long Now Foundation for inviting me. I'm going to talk about belief, and specifically what I consider to be the problem of religious belief. I actually think that how we deal with the subject of belief, how we criticize or fail to criticize the beliefs of other human beings at this moment, has an extraordinary significance for the maintenance of civilization. I think in it could well be the most significant variable that's in our power to influence. So I'm going to talk about belief, and I'm going to say some, some pretty unpleasant things about religious belief. I, I want to warn you up front that I'm going to offend some people in this room, and, and, and that's really not the point. I, I'm not being deliberately provocative. I'm simply worried. I'm, I'm going to worry out loud for the next hour and, and try to make the case to you that we, we have no reason to expect to survive our religious differences indefinitely. Our, our world has been balkanized into separate moral communities. We have Christians against Muslims, against Jews. We, we, have, we have most of the human population living with the idea that the creator of the universe wrote one of their books. And we have many such books on hand. They all make incompatible claims about the nature of this universe. They make non-negotiable claims. And it, it is fundamentally taboo, we should recognize, to criticize religious faith. And this is a taboo I'm about to break over the next hour. First, what do our neighbors believe? Well, 22% of Americans claim to be certain, literally certain, that Jesus is going to come down out of the clouds like a superhero sometime in the next 50 years. 22% claim to be certain about this. Another 22% think he probably will come back in the next 50 years. So that's 44% that's of us who think that the, the human experiment is going to unravel in their lifetime and unravel gloriously. Of course, this belief of Jesus' imminent return is, is knit together with, with a myriad other beliefs. It's not an accident that 44% of Americans also believe that the creator of the universe literally promised the land of Israel to the Jews. This was in his capacity as an omniscient real estate broker. <laughs> The, the, the idea, it should be clear that this is a, a fantastically maladaptive idea, this idea that no matter how bad things get, 
someone's going to come down and wield his magic powers and rectify all of the misdeeds that we perpetrate on this earth. And in fact, he's not going to come down until things get fantastically bad for us. So that it's, it's actually true to say that something like 44% of Americans, if they turned on their television sets and saw that a mushroom cloud had replaced Jerusalem or San Francisco, they, they would see a silver lining in this cloud. Because it would, be, it, would, it would presage that the best thing that is ever going to happen is about to happen. It's, I'm a percussionist as well. Take, take another species of belief. We, we've all been pummeled with this idea that, of intelligent design, this debate that, that is raging in our culture that it, and is really eroding the prestige of science and, and eroding the prestige of our intellectual culture in the eyes of the rest of the world. There really is a problem, this, this idea of intelligent design. I can't imagine anyone in this room has not heard of it, but briefly, this this notion that, that the, the machinery of the cell is so complex that it could not possibly have emerged through naturalistic processes. So it, there has to be a designer, and this designer, while he is He's rather cagely not named so much now. This designer is the biblical God. Okay, this, it, your, your, your kids could one day be taught intelligent design in biology class, and this should trouble all of us. But it is important to point out that intelligent design really is a red herring because depending on what poll you trust, something like 44% or as high as 53% as of, of a month ago of Americans are creationists. They don't, they don't fancy intelligent design as an explanation for evolution. They don't think evolution occurred at all. They think the universe is 6,000 years old and that our only genetic precursors in the natural world were Adam and Eve. It, just consider for a minute the fact that something like half of our neighbors believe that we were created from dirt and divine breath in a garden with a talking snake and a, and a hankering for apples. <laughs> or take another belief that is really, this is really a quaint idea and should be of marginal significance. This idea that, that this Catholic dogma that condom use, contraception, is somehow unethical. I can assure you that the, the, the computational powers of the human brain are insufficient to argue successfully for this, this idea on ethical grounds. I mean, this, is, this is a ludicrous idea. But map this onto sub-Saharan Africa, where something like three million people every year die from AIDS. You would literally have Christian ministers preaching the sinfulness of condom use to people whose only information about condom use is the representation of the ministry. I mean, this, is, this is genocidal stupidity. And, and yet, because of the taboos around criticizing religious faith, we cannot, we cannot treat the Vatican, which still upholds this view, still mandates that this be taught, we cannot treat them like the, the, the criminally negligent organization that they are, at least on this subject. We do not respect other people's beliefs. It's important to point this out. We, on every other subject, we evaluate their reasons. You know, if I stood up here and said the Holocaust never happened, you would be under no burden whatsoever to respect my beliefs about European history. You know, we don't, we don't respect Holocaust deniers. Holocaust deniers don't make it on, on our boards of directors. They don't become presidents of universities. People who think that Elvis is still alive and well and living in middle America don't become presidents of universities. They don't become senators. We don't pass laws against Elvis worship or Holocaust denial. But we successfully marginalize these views. These views 
in every other area of our lives to be highly certain of something with a very low order of evidence or, or in contradiction to a mountain of evidence is, is a sign that something is wrong with your mind. It, it's a sign that you cannot be trusted. And yet, on matters of faith, we completely change the rules. So what, what I'm arguing for you, really, is that we, we should practice a kind of conversational intolerance. Beliefs, let's just pause for a minute and, and think about what a belief is. I mean, we are, when we believe something to be true, we are making our best effort to represent reality in our thoughts. I mean, this is the difference between a belief and a hope, for instance. I mean, when, you, when you hope that something is true, you are, you are representing a possible state of the world. But when you believe that something is true, you are, you are really trying to capture reality as it is in your thoughts. Now, either you, can have, either you have good reasons for what you believe, or you don't. In every other area of our lives, we demand good reasons. And we, we become highly suspicious of people who, who cannot marshal good reasons for their core beliefs. So there really is a conflict between religion and science. So this, this conflict has been papered over by scientists and, and religious people at almost every opportunity. There really is a conflict here because it, it comes down to having good reasons or bad reasons. Every religion is making claims about the way the world is. Everyone is in the business of describing the way reality is. Either Jesus is coming back or he's not. If he, if he comes back out of the clouds, Christianity will stand revealed as a science. That will be the science of Christianity. And every Christian who wants to will be able to say, told you so. I mean, here he is, look at his magic powers. And, and any scientist in his right mind would be convinced by a sufficient display of magic powers. I mean, these are claims, these claims purport to be factual. And yet, no less an organization than the National Academy of Sciences, literally our, our most prestigious scientific body, has said that there's no conflict between religion and science because they, quote, represent different ways of knowing or, quote, ask different questions about the world. This, this is entirely bogus. I mean, just try to, try to graft this, this no conflict idea onto a real-world decision. Take, take stem cell research, for instance. You know, stem cell research is, without a doubt, one of the most promising lines of research in biology to, to generate medical therapies. There are scores of conditions that could well be remediated one of these days by stem cell research. And we are, we are pulling the brakes on this research, and these are and for religious reasons. The, the, the fear is, the religious fear is that we have to kill embryos, human embryos, in order to conduct this research. We have to kill them at a three to five day stage. Perhaps that sounds terrible. What, what is a, a three to five day old human embryo? Well, it's a collection of 150 cells, that not organized into a nervous system. There's no brain. There's a, it's a sphere of cells. Maybe 150 cells sounds like a lot of cells. Well, there are 100,000 cells in the brain of a fly. Flies have brains, flies have neurons, very much like our own. If we know anything at all about the relationship between physical complexity and the possibility of having an experience and the possibility of having interests, it, we know that more suffering is visited upon this earth every time we swat a fly than when we kill a three-day-old human embryo. And yet, the ethical argument never has to get made because of the deference we have for religious faith. Someone need only stand in the Oval Office or on the floor of the Senate and say, you know, my faith teaches me that life starts at the moment of conception. You know, there are souls in those human embryos, and you cannot, one soul can't trump another. 
You can't sacrifice one soul to, to benefit another. End of argument. Well, on the one hand, we have these collections of 150 cells. And on the other, we have little girls suffering from diabetes and full body burns. We've got men and women with Parkinson's disease. We have literally tens of millions of people suffering terrible torments, which could one day be remediated by this research. Okay, it, I submit to you if, you, if you think that the interests of a virtually microscopic collection of cells, I mean, if you had 10 of these in the palm of your hand right now, you would never notice. If you think that the interests of these organisms may yet trump the interests of a little girl with full body burns, you have had your ethical intuitions blinded by religious metaphysics. No, no ethical argument would get you there. No argument that talked about human suffering and its, and its alleviation would get you there. It's not enough to say that these, these collections of cells are potential human beings. It, given genetic engineering, every cell in our body with a nucle nucleus is a potential human being. Every time the president scratches his nose, he's engaged in a holocaust of potential human beings. <laughs> this is literally so. Given the right conditions, Uh, let's just linger for a moment. Uh, I don't want to talk too much about stem cell research, but it, it really it demonstrates the point that we never have to have the conversation because faith trumps rational argument on these subjects. Just take, take the, for a moment the claim that there are souls in this Petri dish, that every human blastocyst, a three-day-old embryo, is ensouled. Okay, well, unfortunately, embryos at that stage can split into twins. So what happens? We have one soul becoming two souls. E embryos at an even later stage can fuse back into what's called a chimera, a single individual born of two embryos. So do we, do we have two souls becoming one soul? The, the, this arithmetic of souls doesn't make much sense. So what I'm arguing for you tonight and what I argue at some length in my book is Either we have good reasons for what we believe, or we don't. And, and faith is the license that religious people give one another to keep believing when reasons fail, to keep believing in the absence of evidence. And this is unacceptable in every other area of our lives. And it, it's actually unacceptable even if you take the wrong religious object. I mean, just imagine how a senator would be perceived if in, in the wake of Hurricane Katrina, he said, you know, we really have not been praying to Poseidon enough. And that, after all, is his jurisdiction. That is the sea we're talking about. You can just imagine what a lunatic misuse of the human mind that would appear to be. It, it's not like someone discovered in the third century that the biblical God really, really exists and Poseidon, he's just a myth. They have exactly the same status, except one has, to speak of the biblical God, something like two billion subscribers. Now, in the face of this rather obvious conflict between religious fundamentalism, certainly, and scientific rationality, many of us, many well-meaning, well-educated people, especially in the West, have created a kind of accommodation to modernity, and we call it religious moderation. Now, I, in my book, I say some very uh, critical things about religious moderation. That's actually been some of the most controversial aspects of my argument. So I want to I want to say those things now, so you get a taste of of uh, my heresy in full. The first thing to concede up front is that religious moderation is better than religious fundamentalism. That nobody flies a plane into a building because he's a religious moderate. <laughs> the, the, the religious moderates are not organizing their lives around apocalyptic prophecy. And this is a very good thing. But religious moderation has some real liabilities. And the first is that it gives an extraordinary amount of cover 
to religious fundamentalism. Because, it, because moderates also have made it taboo to criticize religious faith itself, to criticize the basic project of, of thinking that you're a Jew or a Muslim or a Christian, of, of raising your children to, think, to believe that they are Jews or Muslims or Christians. Because, because religious moderates are still attached to that, that obeisance to, to tradition. They, have, they, they don't want anything too critical said about the people who really, really believe in the literal word of, of their holy books. And this is not serving us at this point. It's, it's even taboo among religious moderates to notice the differences among our religions. That, that all our religions don't teach tolerance and compassion to the same degree. And where they do teach it, they, they don't teach it equally well. This is, you know, fundamentalists understand this. You know, our, our own fundamentalist demagogues, when, when Muslims start flying planes into our buildings, they say Islam is an evil religion. They don't have a problem at noticing the differences among religions. Moderates are the ones who have given us these euphemisms. This idea that, that, it, that Islam, for instance, is a religion of peace that's been hijacked by extremists and that Osama bin Laden is is the Reverend Jim Jones of the Muslim world, or the David Koresh of the Muslim world. Osama bin Laden is articulating a very plausible version of Islam that has more subscribers than we would like to admit. The, the doctrines of martyrdom and jihad are not fringe doctrines in, in Islam. This idea that, that death in defense of the faith is the best thing that could possibly happen to another human being, this really is a deal breaker and this really is believed by millions of Muslims. I mean, to linger on this point for a moment because it really is of excruciating relevance to us at this point. Where are the Tibetan Buddhist suicide bombers? I mean, if, if, if occupation were enough, if, if being conquered by an outside power and being hauled off to jails and tortured were enough to so derange a society that it would form a death cult, like we see brewing in the Muslim world, we should see Tibetan Buddhists blowing themselves up on Chinese buses. We should see Tibetan Buddhists in thr thronging in the streets calling for the deaths of Chinese non-combatants. We do not see this, and, and we, are, we are profoundly unlikely to see it. The Tibetan Buddhists believe a lot of wacky things about the nature of the universe. They don't believe those wacky things that you have to believe to form a death cult. It's not that it's impossible that Buddhism could, could inform a, a, this kind of behavior, and a, actually Zen Buddhism did, to some significant degree, inform the worldview of the kamikaze pilots during World War II. It's interesting to note, I mean, just as a Buddhist scholar, that, that one of the things Zen can be criticized for is not really focusing on compassion to the degree that other schools of Buddhism do. And there's this whole martial spirit and tons of martial metaphors in, in Zen Buddhism that lent themselves rather readily to, to Japanese nationalism. But there are differences among our religions. We are never, by any stretch of the imagination, going to encounter Jain suicide bombers. So Jainism is just, it's a religion of nonviolence. The more deranged you become as a Jain by your religious dog, dogmas, you will become less and less violent. I mean, the really fundamentalist Jains wear cheesecloth over their mouths so they won't inhale bugs. Okay. The core of Jainism really is nonviolence. By, by no stretch of the imagination can you say that the core of Islam is nonviolence. Religious moderates are uniquely ill-placed to concede this. When the, when the religious moderate sees the jihadist on the videotape say things like, we love death more than the infidels love life, and then he blows himself up, it's the religious moderate who is left thinking, no, no that, that couldn't be religion. I mean, that's not, that's propaganda, that's, that guy must have lacked economic opportunities or... Um, I mean, my own, you know, the, the United States, our misadventures in the Middle East must explain that. That's not faith. Okay. Religious moderates don't know what it's like 
to be certain of paradise. Religious moderates don't know what it's like to really believe in the God of the, of the Quran or of, the, of the, the, the Bible, the Old Testament or New. If all you have to do to set, satisfy yourself on this subject is consider the biographies of the 19 hijackers. Who were these guys who woke up on September 11th and decided to fly planes into buildings? The, they were college educated. Many of them had PhDs. They were middle class. They were, they were, these were not people who had histories, personal histories of political oppression. They were not spending inordinate amounts of time agitating for regime change in the Middle East. What, what, they were, what they were spending an inordinate amount of time doing is hanging out at their local mosque in Hamburg talking about the pleasures that await martyrs in paradise and the evils of infidel culture. These were true believers. And you can get their worldview out of the Quran very readily. We are at war with Islamic fundamentalism. But not terror. Terrorism is a tactic. And you know, it's a separate conversation to talk about what percentage of the Muslim world fits this description. And we're, we're certainly, our policy now is not doing anything but alienate more Muslims and create more jihadists. But we have an extraordinary problem because the, the doctrine of Islam really, I mean, we are at war with, with Islamic fundamentalism, but the, the fundamental, we're, we're only at war with Islamic fundamentalism because the fundamentals of Islam really are a problem. And I, I just want to make clear that I'm not talking about a race here. I'm not talking about Arabs. I'm not talking about an ethnicity. I'm talking about John Walker Lynn, the white guy from Marin who went to fight with the Taliban. I'm talking about the logical consequences of ideas. Well, one study, actually, of, of known al-Qaeda operatives found that two-thirds of them were college graduates and middle class. Well, only 52% of Americans have been to any college. Okay, this, is, this is not merely a problem of education. I don't know how many more architects and engineers need to fly planes into our buildings before we realize this is not merely a problem of education. The, our situation is far more sinister than that. It is possible to be so well educated that you could build a nuclear bomb and still think you're going to get the 72 virgins in paradise. Another problem with religious moderation is that it, is, it represents a, a fundamentally unprincipled use of reason. It, it, it really is intellectually bankrupt. At least fundamentalists talk about evidence. You ask a fundamentalist why he believes that Jesus is coming back, and he'll give you a, an evidentiary story. He'll give you an argument. It's not a good argument, but he'll say things like, the New Testament confirms all of Old Testament prophecy or all of the prophecies in the Bible have actually been, come true in history. These are not good, reasonable claims, but if, these were tr if this, this was true, this would be an argument for, the, you know, maybe the Bible is emanating from some omniscient source. Okay, what do moderates talk about when you ask them why they believe in God? Moderates talk about meaning. This belief gives their lives meaning. They, they talk about the good consequences of believing as they do. I want you to appreciate for a moment just what a non sequitur this is when you transfer it to some other subject, some other consoling proposition. This is it's actually this is an example in my book. Imagine if your neighbor claimed to believe that there was a diamond buried in his backyard that's the size of a refrigerator. And you ask him why. You see him out on his lawn digging every Sunday with his family. Imagine how you would feel about his mental faculties if he said, well, this belief gives my life a tremendous amount of meaning. You know, or you don't understand. My family and I really enjoy digging for this on Sundays, and it has a, a remarkable bonding effect on us. <laughs> or, or what if he said, 
I wouldn't want to live in a universe where there wasn't a diamond buried in my backyard. <laughs> it's, it's pretty clear that these responses are inadequate, I mean, deeply inadequate. I mean, they're, they're worse than that. They really are the responses of a madman or an idiot. And it's so easy to see. And yet, change the subject to the existence of God who can hear your prayers, who's looking out for you, despite all of the other devastation we see in the world going on each day. God is protecting you and your family. You change, you change the subject to that proposition, and all bets are off. In fact, you could not possibly get elected to office in this country unless you endorsed that kind of thinking about the existence of God. Another problem with religious moderation is that it is, it's not only intellectually bankrupt, it is theologically bankrupt. It's not like a closer look at the books delivers religious moderation. I've got news for you. I've read the books. God is not a moderate. <laughs> and there's nowhere. You read, certainly, let's just take Christianity and Judaism for a moment. You read the Old Testament. I mean, that, that is a... The worldview urged upon us, the, the kind of society urged upon us, is so needlessly horrible that the truth is most fundamentalist Christians and Orthodox Jews can't take God at his word. I mean, you, the, the killing never stops. I mean, if, you, if you are going to draw your worldview, if you're going to draw your to-do list out of books like Leviticus and Deuteronomy and Exodus, you're going to make Mullah Omar of the Taliban look like Franklin Delano Roosevelt. I mean, it is, it, if your children talk back to you, you kill them. You kill homosexuals. You, if your neighbor's working on the Sabbath, you kill him. If, a, <laughs> if a, a woman's on a virgin on her wedding night, take her to the, the edge of town and stone her to death. If you, come, if you come into a town and you see someone praying to a foreign god, you kill him, you kill his family, you kill every man, woman, and child in the town. You kill wizards, you kill mediums, you kill fornicators, you kill adulterers. The, the list is long and preposterous. And there, there are actually some groups in this country that want to return to that style of life. There, there's this movement, it's uh, probably, not no, probably not well known to you all, but Christian Reconstructionists, also known as Dominionists, actually just bite the bullet here and say, yeah, well, that is what God wants. That law has not been rescinded. And they're right. The law is not rescinded. But many Christians are living with this idea that Jesus, somewhere in his ministry, fundamentally repudiated all of Old Testament law. There are a few lines where you can get Jesus to say something seemingly like that. But there's, there's so much else in the New Testament that ramifies Old Testament law. And these, these Christian reconstructions, by the way, are, are amazingly influential. The, 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 the level of activism we see in, in the fundamentalist community now has largely been seeded by them because they, the, the, another thing Christian reconstructionists believe is that Jesus is not going to come back until after a, a millennium of Christian beatific domination of the, of the globe. So we have to fully establish a Christian world before Jesus comes back. They're in a minority believing this, but, but their, their energy, the energy with which they have approached that task has been contagious, and they, these are not... People believing this stuff are not fringe characters in our society. There are people who can get Karl Rove on the phone who want to practice the worldview of Leviticus, killing homosexuals, for instance. Just to, to linger on this point of, of, of what, they, what Christianity, to take a specific subset, actually advocates. It, it's, it's not an accident that St. Augustine and St. Thomas Aquinas, the two of the great lights of the Christian tradition, both thought heretics should be tortured. It, actually, Augustine 
thought they should be tortured, and his argument for the use of torture actually laid the foundations for the Inquisition. Aquinas thought they should just be killed outright. The, these, are, these are the great lights of, of the Christian tradition. These, these guys are still taught in every great book seminar in this country. And, and it's important to point out that this is totally reasonable given certain rather ludicrous ideas. If, if you, but if you think that the creator of the universe really wrote this book, it's, it's insane not to live by it. And living by it gets you by no accident, the kind of life we saw for, for 500 years in medieval Europe, we were burning people alive for heresy. Again, we look from our perch in the present, we look back on this and we think, well, this, these people were just deranged. You know, this is just a whole culture plunging into psychopathology. It's really not true. It is, it, just think about this. If your neighbor can say something to your child that is so spiritually wayward that it could put your child in peril for eternity, I mean, literally just drive your child into eternal torment, that person next door is far more dangerous than a, a child molester. So really believing this stuff has consequences. and. We, secularists and moderates, have fundamentally lost touch with the fact that millions and millions of people really believe this stuff. The, the final problem with religious moderation, in my view, is that because most of us, most moderates, are, are content to merely relax their hold on all of these superstitions and taboos that are coming to us from these traditions. Because it's just, because moderation is just a, a hewing to these traditions and to these texts and to these dogmas, but just kind of relaxing the literalism. And it's believed that that is good enough. In fact, that is somehow necessary and redeeming, and we, it, we, that's indispensable for us as a culture. It prevents us from developing rational, creative, 21st century alternatives to religion. The, the, the search for better alternatives has stopped because we're Jews, we're Christians, we're Muslims, and, and all of that is terrifically important. It's important to point out that we decide what's good in the good book. I mean, we take our ethical intuitions to the text. And when we, when we read the golden rule, for instance, we decide, yeah, that is a great distillation of our ethical intuitions. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Okay, that's a keeper. Okay, we decide that. If, this is the, if the Bible is the best book we have on moral questions... In, you know, if you're a fundamentalist, it's the best book we have because it's literally been inspired by the Holy Ghost or it's literally been dictated by the creator of the universe. If you're a moderate, it's the best book we have because the, the wisest people and the wisest tradition that has ever existed has, has delivered us this text. If either of those claims are true, well, consider... Consider what kind of morality falls out of that. I mean, consider a moral question that has been solved to everyone's satisfaction. Well, consider the question of slavery. Slavery was an abomination. We are all we are we are relieved of a terrible moral burden, no longer practicing slavery. Thomas Jefferson would have been a better man had he freed his slaves. Absolutely. If this is the best book we have, if the Bible is the best book we have, Old or New Testament, by the way, we should be practicing slavery. The creator of the universe clearly expects us to keep slaves. He simply tells us not to beat them so badly that we knock out their eyes or their teeth, because then we have to set them free. But he otherwise tells us how to keep slaves. Jesus clearly expects us to keep slaves. He never repudiates the institution of slavery. He talks about, he, he, he refers to slaves in his parables. He talks about slaves being beaten by their masters and, and never puts this into question. 
Paul in 1 Timothy admonishes slaves to serve their masters well and to serve their Christian masters especially well so as to partake in their holiness. If this is the best book we have, the abolitionists were on the wrong side of the argument. And it, it should be no, a surprise to no one that the slaveholders of the South for many long years justified their practices by resort to the good book. So my argument, and really one of the central conclusions of my book, is that all we have is human conversation. All we have is, is our own ethical intuitions exercised in conversation with other human beings. You can either put your faith in a 21st century conversation with all of our intellectual resources available to us, or you can put your faith in some other century's conversation as enshrined in one of these books. You can put your faith in an, in an Iron Age conversation if, to take the Bible, or you can put your, put your faith in a 7th century conversation to t if you take the Quran. The problem with faith is that it really is a conversation stopper. It, it, the moment you... Faith is a declaration of immunity to the powers of conversation. It is a, it is a, a reason why you do not have to give reasons for what you believe. This is really a problem because when the stakes are high, we have a simple choice between conversation and violence. At the level of societies, we have a choice between conversation and war. Faith, religious faith, is the only area of discourse where immunity to conversation is considered noble. It's the only area of our lives where someone can win points for saying, there's nothing that you could say that would change my mind. I mean, just imagine a, a medical doctor saying, there's nothing that could be said that will change my mind. It, that, is, that claim is synonymous with saying, I'm taking no state of the world ultimately into account in believing what I believe. There's nothing that could change about the world to, that, that would cause me to revise my beliefs. This is, it should be clear that this is intrinsically divisive. I mean, the only thing that guarantees that our collaboration with one another is truly open-ended is our willingness to have our core beliefs revised through the power of conversation. Now, there are two kinds of conflict born of, of faith and, and, and its mode as a conversation stopper. I mean, there, there are a lot of people dying in the name of faith, and they're not explicitly theological grievances being exercised. I mean, you take something like uh, the violence in Northern Ireland or, or the, the fragmentation of, of the former Yugoslavia. These are, these are conflicts that, that are, when, it, when the societies got stressed, they broke along religious lines. But it's not like the Irish were fighting over the, the, the doctrine of the transubstantiation. But still, the problem is their moral identities were organized around this, this adherence to a tradition. And I mean, there, there, clearly there are other forms of, of division in our world. There's nationalism, there's tribalism generally, there's racism. But, but religious faith is the most articulate layer of human difference. It is, really, it is really the level at which you, you can learn to demonize other human beings. So there's that violence. And it is, it is pervasive in our world. But then there's also the added violence that is explicitly theological, where, where people would not otherwise be behaving this way at all, but for what they believe about God. And this is and jihadism and the, the, the daily explosions we, we see or read about in the world is, is the preeminent example here. So 
So my argument really, and, and the, the, the central argument of my book, is that to make religious war unthinkable, the way that things like slavery and cannibalism seem poised to become, to make it unthinkable, we have to undermine the dogma of faith. We have to, to repudiate this idea that beliefs can be sanctified by something other than evidence and argument. Now, I've just said many nasty things about religion. This is, this is not to say that religion is merely a shell game, that it's just a, a tissue of, of lies and self-deceptions and cognitive errors that are designed to inure us to the threat of death. It, it's, it is that to some significant degree, but it is not merely that. There is no doubt that human beings have spiritual experiences, for, for lack of a better word. I use these words, I use words like spiritual and mystical in my book and, and have received much grief from atheists on the subject. But th there's no doubt that there's a wing, there's, there's, there's an, an end of the spectrum of positive human experience that very few people explore and that has traditionally been explored in a religious, contemplative context. And it is fantastically interesting it should be of interest to us scientifically and personally. Every culture has produced people who have wandered off into the desert for 40 days and 40 nights or, or spent 20 years in a cave and come out talking about how human experience, our moment-to-moment -moment experience of the world can be deliberately transformed through introspection, through meditation, through prayer, through, through deliberate uses of attention. The problem is that these claims have always been made in a religious context and are now, in our world, virtually always cluttered with religious dogma to a greater and lesser degree. I mean, one, uh, in the spirit of violating the taboo of noticing our, the differences among our religions, the wisdom the, of contemplative life, spiritual, mystical wisdom, is, has by no means been evenly distributed throughout the world. No more so than scientific insight has been evenly distributed. The, the East really does have something over the West when, when it comes time to talk about an empirical, non-dogmatic, first-person science, an approach to introspection that really delivers the goods. It's not that there have been extraordinary individuals in the West, there have been the Meister Eckharts and other people who, who transcended the limits of their, of their doctrine. But the, the, the disparity is rather extraordinary between Eastern and Western mystical wisdom. I mean, it's, it's, it's every bit, in, to, in my view, it's every bit as, as extraordinary as the difference between Western, Western medicine and Eastern medicine. And maybe there are some conditions for which Eastern medicine is better. But you know, if you have an appendicitis, you better hope you can get to a Western-style hospital and get a Western-trained surgeon to work on you. Incidentally, if you get, do get an appendicitis, you might consider the fact that you've been intelligently designed. The appendix <laughs> is proof positive that this is a bogus idea. So I want, uh, I've lost track of time. How are we, do you have a, is anyone keeping the clock? Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, briefly, I just wanted to say what I think are the, the messages of our contemplative traditions that we, we can incorporate into our 21st century worldview, that we must incorporate, really. Because the burden is upon us to develop a thoroughgoing science of human happiness, an approach to human happiness that addresses questions of human happiness at every level, biochemically, psychologically, economically, politically, every level. And one, of, one necessary level, I would argue, is contemplative. We have to make sense of the fact that it's possible to go into a cave for 10 years and be 
perfectly happy. This is not to say that, that that's a path to happiness for everybody. No doubt there are people who go into caves who are completely deranged or deranged by the experience. But it, the, one of the core insights of our contemplative traditions is that there is something about human consciousness that can be recognized in the present moment. The, the very part of you that is hearing the sound of my voice, there's something that can be recognized about what it is to be conscious in this moment that transcends the vagaries of, of pleasant and unpleasant experience. That there, there's a kind of mystical well-being that we can discover. I mean, it's, it's interesting to note that you know, solitary, going into a cave, solitary confinement is considered a, a, a punishment even inside a prison for most people. I mean, this is what it's like to be the prisoner of one's thoughts. And we, in the West, we have a, a really impoverished conception of sanity. We, we think all day long, from the, from the moment we, we were chased out of bed by our thoughts in the morning, we think, 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 think all day long. And very few of us, and certainly very few exemplars in, in the Western tradition, have, have talked intelligently about the possibility of not being lost in thought. What would a human mind be like that was not continuously colored by this, this discursivity? And in the, in the East and in Buddhism especially, they have spent millennia on this and delivered some very compelling insights. And just to, uh, uh, lest this seem like a, a crazy eruption of, of speculative philosophy, I just want to try to tie this down for a second. Because it's, I want to make sense of, to you of the claim that it's possible to, there's something to be glimpsed about the nature of your consciousness right now that is not obvious to you and yet is right on the surface. And by analogy, I, I want you to reflect on the existence of, the, of the, uh, the blind spot, the optic blind spot. We all know we have a blind spot in both visual fields. It's, it's, it results from the, the transit of the, the optic nerve through the retina of each eye. We've all, I'm sure all of you have had it pointed out to you, you draw a spot on a piece of paper and you move that piece of paper until the spot disappears and that proves there is something, there's an area in your visual field that you're not getting information from, though your visual field seems seamless to you. Now, most people in this world probably don't know about the blind spot and most of us who know about it go for decades without thinking about it and we certainly don't notice it. But it is there to be noticed. If you look out across this room, Somebody is probably missing a head. <laughs> I mean, it's, it, it's there to be seen, and it takes some doing to see it. There is an analogous fact about the nature of human consciousness. And, and, the, and the fact is this. Consciousness does not feel like a self. It does not feel like what we take ourselves to be moment to moment, most of our lives. The, the sense that we are the thinker of our thoughts. The, the, experience of our, the experiencer of our experience. I mean, most of us feel like, we, we don't feel identical to the, our sphere of experience. We feel like we are having an experience. We feel like we're riding around in our head, somewhere behind our eyes, not identical to our body, not identical to the contents of consciousness. This is a kind of cognitive error that really can be seen through. And it, it takes some doing, it takes some study, it takes some meditation, it, it, it can take a lot of work, but it holds immense implications for us as a species, and, and it, it holds immense implications for our conception of human happiness and what is norm, normative human behavior. And, and finally, science is starting to, to turn its attention on this, and I, I'm sure many of you know that, that uh, there's a very... Uh, fruitful dialogue happening between neuroscientists and, and contemplatives, mostly Buddhist contemplatives, but contemplatives generally. And what it links up to in neuroscience is this idea that, that our brains really are plastic, that, we, that they're, they are, there's a neuroplasticity there that allows the, the brain to change itself based on how it is used. The, the, the brain is really an instrument that changes based on how it is, it is played. And it, like positive mental states 
are, are skills, essentially. Just as you can learn to play the piano, you can learn to feel differently about other human beings. You can learn to feel compassion where you otherwise wouldn't. And this, this dialogue is just beginning, but it's, it's something that, it's a dialogue we need to have completely unconstrained by religious dogmatism. So to, to wrap up, I just want, one way of summarizing what I've said is that everyone really is a scientist in that everyone is making claims about the way the world is. And everyone is a mystic in the sense that everyone is, is seeking happiness in a context that is, in some basic sense, hostile to the terms of our search. I mean, we are seeking happiness, seeking durable happiness in the context of an ever-changing experience. So what I'm asking you to imagine is what would it be like to have a culture where we, we came to terms with this fact, where we came to terms with the reality of death, this astonishing fact that all of us are going to die, this, this astonishing fact that living long enough, all of us will witness the death of everyone we love. If, if it is possible to find true well-being in the midst of this circumstance, we should be desperate to find it, and we should be desperate to use all of our tools, all of our 20th first century tools, and, and articulate these truths in terms that are not divisive, in terms that, are, that, that do not demand belief in the preposterous. So my argument really is that the end game for civilization, if we're talking about long-term thinking, the end game is not political correctness. It is not the mere toleration of, 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 of patent absurdity. It really is reason and reasonableness and an openness to conversation. Thank you very much. I'll talk about end times and the questions. Thank you. So the end times. This is a seminar sponsored to encourage long-term thinking, but it seems as if, at least in the fundamentalist variety of religion, there's a lot of emphasis on the end times, meaning that we're about to have the end times, we'd have no future. Can you say anything about what you've learned about this idea of the end times? Yeah, yeah, well there's, as I said at the beginning, something like 45, 44% of us subscribe to this basic view that the end is very near, it's somewhere in the next 50 years. And it should be clear that this has geopolitical consequences. This has, an amazing number of people are narrowly focused on literally one building in the Middle East. We, we have the, the Al-Aqsa Mosque built upon the, the site of the, the old temple. And many fundamentalist Christians and Orthodox Jews, Orthodox Jews think the Messiah will not come until that mosque is raised and the temple is rebuilt. Fundamentalist Christians think Jesus won't come back until that mosque is raised and the temple is rebuilt. And Muslims the world over take a, an ex exquisite interest in the integrity of that mosque. It's considered the third holiest site in the, in the Muslim world. It really is not an exaggeration to say that, that if anything happens to that building, you know, the wheels come off. I mean, this, it really could be, there's a, there's, a, there's a piece of architecture that could precipitate World War III. It is it's considered so sacred, and the, the Muslims, incidentally, have the same kind of eschatology. I mean, there's slight differences. Incidentally, Jesus is going to come back and preach Islam, but this this idea that the world is going to end, and 
it is going to end in your generation very likely. And that its ending somehow is a good thing because it is the necessary precursor to the best thing. That, that's a very scary belief and it is, it is not a fringe belief. It, uh, perhaps you, you guys remember this, but Reagan brought Hal Lindsey, a religious lunatic of the first order, and Jerry Falwell, a lunatic of the second order, perhaps, it, in to brief the, the Pentagon on the, the implications of biblical prophecy for our strategic situation vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union. Okay, this, is, this is not, the, and, and the current administration, while I, you know, I'm not a fan of, of the presidents, I don't think he, I mean, he, who knows what he believes, but he doesn't strike me as a, as a Pat Robertson character. The fact that Pat Robertson could even aspire to, to launch a, a presidential campaign should terrify us. And the fact that people like him and, and uh, uh, Dobson, more relevantly at the moment, have the ear of those uh, in power uh, and can exact concessions from those in power. And that we have people like Tom DeLay who say that they came to, into the business of government to, to forward a biblical worldview. These, these beliefs are operative and they are fundamentally hostile to our creating a durable future for ourselves. Now, it, it's true, we, we had a speaker, or maybe three speakers ago, um, who came from a scientific point of view and then was offering a different kind of end time. So what do you think of the faith that a coming technological singularity will be a, a apocalyptic event in the next 50 years? Uh, you must be speaking about Ray Kurzweil. Yes, I am. Uh, I, well, I have not read his book, the, so I, I can't uh, really comment on, on that thesis. The, the idea that our exponential advances in technology could transform human society in a way that is presently unthinkable, uh, it seems to me there are good reasons to believe that. And it's uh, what the time frame in, is and what, what transformations are likely, that's, that's uh, certainly a subject for, for reasonable debate. The issue, though, is I mean, there, there are many scientific ideas that are fantastically strange, far even stranger than the idea that somebody was born of a virgin or, or is coming back or that there's an there's a omniscient being who can hear your prayers. I mean, that, that those are, are strange ideas. But, you know, Martin Rees, the, the, uh, the royal astronomer, recently wrote that because this, this, in, this thesis in physics of um, inflation this idea that we, there could be myriad bubble universes and all functioning by different laws and that basically everything that could be tried has been tried. Uh, this, gets, this bequeaths the notion that you should expect that there are, with this many universes, that there are going to be many, many civilizations far more advanced than our own and that these super intelligent beings will have invented computation and that their com computation will be so powerful that, that they'll be able to simulate whole universes in their computers. And almost by definition, these, new, these simulated universes will outnumber real universes. And therefore, we should expect to find ourselves in a simulation rather than in a real universe. Now, this is a, a very weird idea. And I mean, if it, it's, it suggests to me, one thing that it suggests to me is that physics has now become so rarefied that it's almost impossible to know when a physicist is joking. <laughs> but the, the important thing to point out is that there is a difference between having reasons to believe this and having no reasons. And, to, and, and one thing we, we, we maintain in scientific discourse, no matter how weird it gets at the peripheries, is an intellectual honesty where we, when we're certain about something, we claim we're certain. When we're not certain, we don't claim we're certain. And, and, and the, the pressure to vet ideas and to jettison dogma wherever you can find it is exquisite in science and it is non-existent in orthodox religion. 
By the way, that uh, question was for Mark L. We kind of like to use names here. This is a question from Amber. Um, if you want to raise your hand, you can. Um, from all the feedback you've received uh, on your book or in person at a talk like this one, what comment or question has shifted your perspective the most from what you originally wrote or said? Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's an interesting question. I, I don't know if there's one comment. One thing that I did just before the book was published is I created a website. And the, the difference between having done that and not doing it, it was so extraordinary because I've just had thousands of emails. and. But for the website, I would have no idea who was reading the book and what their, their response was. And I mean, the emails have just come from the most, the craziest range of, of people. I mean, there, there are the ministers in the South still practicing as ministers, but have completely lost their faith and just can't figure out what other job they're qualified for. <laughs> They've written me. Then there, there are people who, um, I mean, one, one thing that's interesting, and this is, I didn't have to write my book to discover this. I mean, you, you spend long enough in academia, you discover this. Uh, in fact, you discover this nowhere so readily as in a philosophy seminar. People very rarely change their minds. I mean, they're, they're, you can, I can count on one hand the number of times I've seen someone undergo a full change of perspective just fully blown in real time, oh my God, I didn't see it that way, I repudiate everything I was talking about a moment ago. And those, those are like supernova explosions in the universe. Those rarely happen. And, uh, and bearing witness to that, I mean, just seeing how intractable our attachment is to religious mythology, even by, by very smart people. I mean, I get... Um, the same objections over and over again. It's, it's, it's really, it, uh, the whole notion of a meme is, is, is very compelling. When you see the same language and the same why, why is not coming to you from very disparate sources coming reflexively. And um, yeah, I mean, that's, I don't know if that's an adequate answer to that question. So have you changed your mind about anything? Oh, good question. Um, <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm open-minded. I mean, one thing that's come to me that is uh, a doubt that is creeping into my uh, discourse on this subject is I don't know what the normative response would be to our situation. I mean, I, I'm advocating something. I'm advocating what I've come to call a conversational intolerance, where we uh, apply the same standards of reasonableness on, on questions about God and ethics and the afterlife that we apply on every other subject. But I, I clearly would not want the President of the United States to speak the way I just spoke. You know, that would be, that would be so inflammatory. I mean, just, just take the Muslim world as, as I mean, let, let's say we completely put our house in order domestically and the 260 million Americans who claim to be certain that they are in that they have a relationship with God, changed their minds and thought just the way I thought, then we still have a, an immense problem. How do we speak reasonably in the face of the, of the, the religious polarities in our world? And I'm, I'm starting to feel that I, mean, I, simply, I simply don't know, and I don't know how steep the, the honesty curve should, should be. Um, and, I, and I'm the first to admit that I am not the face of diplomacy on this subject. Uh, and so that, I mean, that has been brought home to me. It's been hammered into me over these many months. Here's a question from um, Wayne Welch. Again, if you want to identify. Um, what accounts for the resurgence of religious literalism, fundamentalism in the U.S. since the era of the Scopes monkey trial, say, since 1920s? Yeah, it's, well, there's certainly the perception that there's a resurgence, and I think there is a, there is a political empowerment, even in, in, under the current administration, that is, appears to be new. I, I, I can't untangle just how much I'm just paying attention to it more and how much it's always been there, but the, as far as what people believe, that has been remarkably stable. I, ever since Scopes, 
the Gallup polling goes back about 70 or 80 years, and you, on questions like, do you think Satan literally exists? Do you think Jesus was literally born of a virgin? Many, many questions. The, the, the percentages just tick, you know, within the margin of error through the decades. It's not like we have suddenly produced many fundamentalists who weren't there 70 years ago. This is a question from, I, I can't read your writing, but it's maybe a Noah. Um, whatever else can be said about religion, it does provide an emotional component, happiness and hope. Science does not have as much emotional impact because we dismiss emotions as irrational. What can we do to focus a discussion on the emotional benefits of science instead of the irrational drawbacks of religion? Yeah, that's a good question. Well. The first thing to point out is that science has just fundamentally not addressed questions of human happiness for most of its career. I mean, it, now there is a, a conception of positive psychology. Now people are asking questions about human happiness and normative states in neuroscience and in psychology. Uh, there are people doing neuroimaging work on compassion, for instance. But this is a, a really recent development. And therefore, religion has seemed to be the only game in town all, all these years, even with, even, even with the steady encroach of, of, of a scientific worldview that, that has beaten back uh, religious ignorance on every other subject. I mean, there was a time where you could, you know, you have epilepsy, really, but nobody knows what epilepsy is, so you're, the diagnosis is de demonic possession, right? Well, now that's not such a common diagnosis, and we understand that when when people are having seizures, there's another reason for it. There has to be an analogous breakthrough on questions of happiness and on questions of spiritual experience. And it's just, you know, it's in, it's in the offing because the effort simply has not been made. Um, another, another thing I'd like to, to say in address to that question is that this idea that somehow our religious affiliations, our religious beliefs are doing a lot of work for us. They're really consoling and they're underwriting morality in some way. This, this is a, it, it, this is largely disproved by just the character of belief in Western Europe. I mean, the, Western Europe is, bears almost no resemblance to the United States in terms of the level of religious adherence. And, and if you look at the, the, the UN indices of a society's health, you look at, at um, per capita income, literacy, homicide rates, uh, rates of other violent crime, every index of a, of a society's health, the most atheist, athe, atheistic societies in the world are the best off. I mean, societies like Iceland and Sweden and Australia and um, Denmark and the Netherlands. I mean, these, these are, in Sweden, something like 80% of people claim to be atheists. You know, here, 83% claim to believe that Jesus literally rose from the dead. So it, the idea that somehow this belief system is giving us, is paying such great dividends in terms of our uh, treating one another well in this society, that, that, is, that remains to be proven. That said, it is true that if you really believe that death is only apparent and you're going to be re reunited with everyone you love after you die, really believing that has consequences and it takes the sting out of death. I mean, it has to. If you think that you just have to wait a few years until you die and then you're going to see your kid again and everyone else who you, who you otherwise would be terribly aggrieved to lose in this life. Uh, one real problem with that is that we, we, on the geopolitical level, we want the sting very much in death. I mean, we are now confronting people who have taken the sting out of death, and we have destructive technology proliferating, we, we have to anticipate a time where we may have the functional, the psychological equivalent of the 19 hijackers as a regime with long-range nuclear weapons. 
And that is, in that situation, you don't want the sting out of death. You want, you want deterrence. You want people who are afraid to die, who are or otherwise don't, are not eager to die. And so, um, anyway, this could be a long conversation about what positive virtues, perhaps, come out of religious thinking and what the alternatives are. Clearly, we want rational alternatives. This is a question from Dorian. You can identify yourself if, if you want to. The new, uh, this maybe it's a San Francisco question. The new age scene, especially the psychedelic angle, consisted of people very interested in technology and science and spirituality. What do you think about this fusion of spirituality and science and tech? Um, well, one way into this is that at the level of the brain, which we're talking about the fact that, that, that our nervous system is perturbable. It's perturbable based on how we consciously use our attention. It's perturbable based on ingesting various compounds that, that uh, either act like neurotransmitters or modulate our own neurotransmitters and neuromodulators. I mean, this is, this is a, uh, as an organism, we can intervene in our experience and, and, and certain interventions are uh, normative and really interesting and worth pursuing and others carry serious liabilities. I mean, one problem that speaks specifically about drugs, for instance, we have one word, we have this word drug to name this range of compounds that some of which bear absolutely no resemblance in their effects to others. I mean, it, the word drug is a word like religion. It, it, you know, there, there's a very different religions and there are very different drugs. And, um, you know, like I'm sure many people in this room, I've had uh, psychedelic experiences that have been extraordinarily useful. Uh, and there's also something about psychedelics in their current state, which, um, which seems rather imprecise and haphazard. And, you know, I happen to think that meditation um, and meditation retreats, you know, very deliberate weeks and months spent uh, pract learning to practice various techniques of meditation is a much more systematic and um, it, it has fewer of the liabilities. And, and some of the same states certainly can be experienced that way. Yeah, I have, I have two questions uh, remaining here. Here's one of them from Pat. Uh, could you describe some of the emotional experiences of being an outspoken promoter of reason? Well, it's a new, uh, it's, my career as a heretic it essentially just started. So it's, um, I guess my, the, in large part, it's been, it's been amazingly gratifying. I mean, the, the, the reception, despite how impolitic my message is, the, re the reception has largely been uh, totally positive and supportive. I mean, I, I do get the, the occasional scary email and, and many people who are praying for me. Uh, <laughs> but it's, it's really, you know, it's, it's very gratifying. It's, it's a... Um, it, it feels necessary, and it's not, it's not really, um, there's something effortless about it because I, I, I just feel compelled to do it at this point. It's not, it's not like I, I feel like I'm co continually making choices to open my big mouth. I, you know, somebody like Stuart invites me, and it's, it's, um, it just feels like an essential thing to be doing. So it's, uh, there's, there's not too much friction in me at this point. Um, and I've had a lot of, to overcome in order to be able to do it, but it's, um, uh, it's gratifying to just feel like uh, I'm doing something that, that is necessary to do at this point. So, good. Um, so the last question is host prerogative, so it's a question for me. Um, I believe in God, um, and the more I think about my belief, this strange idea, um, the more I use my reason, um, the more I believe in God. 
And um, actually, I would like not to believe because it was actually easier as an atheist. When I was an atheist, it was actually easier. It took less work. And now that I do have a belief, it takes more reason on my part. So um, can you help me not believe? Uh, what, what would you, what would this, you have this me? This is one of those surprising questions that one's What would you have me for. do? Um, well, I, I would want to know what you meant by God. I mean, precisely, you'd have to unpack that belief for me because, there's, again, there's a range. We've got this one word, God, and when you dig into the details with people, you get very, I mean, there are people who just, just want to assert that there's something bigger than ourselves, you know, that there's, that there, and, and that it has a kind of moral component to it, that there's, there is love in the universe, or that it matters that, that we treat one another well. Um, and, and those and, aren't religions? And, and, are they and, religions? and those are, and, and, and they wrap the, all of that up in the term God, and it has nothing to do with uh, a God who could possibly hate homosexuals, for instance. Um, so I would need to know, I mean, if, if you actually want to have this conversation, I, I'm happy to, um, but I would, need, I would need to know many other things about what you actually believe. So, so it's not about belief in God per se, but more about religions. What was that? It's less about a belief in God and more about the dangers of, of a faith in a, in a religion. You mean my, my yes. argument, yeah. Yes. Well, it's, it's about the dangers of dogma, essentially. It's, it's the, dan the danger of, of pretending to be certain about things that you're not certain about. It's the, it's the danger of this double standard where, where in every other area of our lives we maintain an intellectual honesty and we, de and, and we demand that others do likewise. And yet on this subject, we just rewrite the rules. And I think that we can have, we certainly can have ethical and moral experience. We can have strong communities and we can even have the most esoteric mystical experience without ever asserting anything on insufficient evidence. 